This is Research Like a Pro, episode 296, My GPC Library with Barry Chodak. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogist professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the authors of Research Like a Pro, a genealogist guide. With Robin Worthland, they also co-authored the companion volume, Research Like a Pro with DNA. Join Diana and Nicole as they discuss how to stay organized, make progress in their research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go! Today's episode is sponsored by Newspapers.com, your go-to resource for unlocking the stories of your ancestors. Hi everyone, welcome to Research Like a Pro. Hi Nicole, how are you today? Really good, how are you? I'm doing well. I've been working on writing up my research on my Pennsylvania German, Johann Valentine Schultz. Don't you love that name, Valentine? It was apparently originally Velton in Germany and became Valentine in the United States. So it's been fun to write that up. And, you know, this was my first stab at this ancestor. And what I'm discovering is that there needs to be like a full on project. This was for the 14 day mini challenge. And I just wanted to discover more about why he immigrated to colonial Pennsylvania in the 1730s. And I discovered that actually there are two Valentines that appear to show up and nobody's exactly sure which one it is on the ship's passenger list. (laughs) And so now I want to do a study of all the associates and look at the families and just see if I can get some clarity because a lot has been written about this, you know, with descendants and there's a lot of theories out there and, and I'd like to kind of create my own theory, but that's going to be more research. Oh, wow. I didn't realize there were two men of a similar name. And Valentine is such a great name. Love it. (laughs) It got passed down a bit in the family too, which is fun. Yeah, I do remember about that with the Schultz line. Great. Well, our next Research Like a Pro webinar is March 16th with Allison Cotter, using Research Like a Pro to trace an African-American ancestor back through enslavement. Allison is one of our professional genealogists at Family Locket, and she will be talking about Martin Fambro. He was born in slavery around 1838 in South Carolina and died in Georgia. His wife was Frances Collier, and the family knew very little of his life before he came to Dalton, Georgia in 1880. This case study goes through the process of following the clues left by Martin to trace him back to when he was enslaved and to extend his ancestry. This will be an interesting case study focusing on enslaved Americans, Georgia, wills and estates, land deeds, and newspapers. If you would like to join our newsletter, you can receive a weekly email from us every Monday with any coupons and new blog posts and podcast episodes that we've put out. Well, today we are excited to have a guest with us. We have... Barry Chodak here from genealogical.com, and we are going to be talking about a new feature from Genealogical called the My GPC Library. So hello, Barry. Well, hi. So great to have you here. I have to tell a little bit about how we met. So last year at the National Genealogical Society Conference in Richmond, Virginia, Barry and I were both invited to a breakfast by Family Search and walking out of the hotel, walking across the street together, we started chatting and discovered that, you know, of course, we both love genealogy. And Barry told me all about the MyGPC library and later in the expo hall demonstrated it. And back then, I knew that we needed to have him on the podcast and tell our listeners about this wonderful resource. So we are going to talk all about that today. But first, Barry, I would love to have you tell us a little bit about genealogical publishing, how that got started, your involvement with that. And let's just start with that. Well, if I go back uh, to the origins, uh, when my dad proposed to my mom, uh, she said, I won't marry you until you have a real job. So he opened a bookstore. He always loved books. He was a, a book scout. He would find old books and knew who was looking for a particular rare book. And that's really the origins of the company. He noticed that people were interested in books with a lot of names 
and was curious enough to say, oh, genealogy. So in 1952, when offset lithography became an acceptable way to duplicate a book, dad started reprinting some of the evergreen titles in genealogy. And that was the start of the company. That is amazing. So it's been around for 70 years, <laughs> plus or minus a few. And I know our listeners have probably seen that in many books that you have ordered that title, Genealogical Publishing. So it's so fun to hear the origins. But what we're really excited about now is this new GPC library. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, over the years, when the internet came along, the book kind of lost its prominence. And we knew we needed to find some way of staying viable in a digital world. And so, Kelly, it's been about 10, 12 years now. We started working to uh, convert some of our best books to ebooks and offering them on the site. But as the amount of new material got smaller and smaller, you know, we're not offered nearly the the number of books that we that we used to be offered back in the 70s, 80s, and even the 90s. Uh, I took a look and went, if we're going to be able to continue, we're going to need to have the company have, at, shall we say, putting all the books together in a collection would be more valuable than the individual titles themselves. Because the titles cover you know, so many different areas geographically, by time period, by subject. So I went looking for a platform. And the, the first platform I found just didn't have the tools that I wanted. I kept looking and looking and through a you know, kind of a, a lucky happenstance came upon the vital source platform called Bookshelf. Bookshelf is the reading platform with great tools for, for searching, for bookmarking, note-taking, highlighting. It even has a, a, a way of grabbing a citation you know, for a book. Uh, if you're a busy person, you can use the read aloud <laughs> feature like that. And it has an, an app that you can download to uh, a laptop, an iPad, or a phone, and then uh, access all the books online, download what you want to use onto the bookshelf app, and go to the beach or to the mountain, wherever you are, like that, and have access to the book work with them. And then when you reconnect to the internet, all of the work that you've done is synced to your books so that you never lose your notes. Even if you stop subscribing, if you stop subscribing for whether it's a month or a couple of years, when you come back, your notes will still be there. Of course, you can uh, download them uh, before you end your subscription. You can always do copy and paste from the pages. And, uh, you know, I find it to be a terrific app. It even adds a lot of great protection for our authors, which today makes a big difference. On you know, too many occasions, people will say, oh, it's really free. Let me just share it or give people access or a copy and like that, not realizing that what it does is uh, discourage authors and publishers uh, these days. So it's a great way of protecting the authors and making a great tool available for people. Hmm. Well, as an author, I love that, that you are trying to protect authors because we put a lot of work into the books that we come up with. So just for our listeners, I'll just explain a little bit about what the website says. This says that my GPC library has 800 of the best titles in genealogy and family history, which is amazing. And I love that you have got the subscription set up so that someone could have it just for three months, do a lot of in-depth research, like you said, and put their notes in there. You know, we would always recommend, of course, that you use your research log, you know, capture the information you need. But then if someone wanted to do six months, they could, or a year, you know, so many different options. And with so many books out there, this just sounds like a wonderful tool to get you into some of these really specific titles. And we will talk a little bit later about some of the books that we found that we're interested in browsing through this. 
So we're excited to have this new resource. Yes, we are. This has been really fun. And thank you, Barry, for letting us have a little trial so we could talk about it on the podcast. One book that I know you're all wondering, is it in there, is Elizabeth Schoen Mill's Evidence Explained. And yes, the answer is you can view Evidence Explained, the third edition there in my GPC library. And the pages look just like they do in the the printed book, which is nice if that's what you're used to seeing. And I love that you can access that from your phone or your tablet if you have downloaded the app and you can have it with you wherever you go and you can have your bookmarks in your notes, helping you make citations on the fly wherever you are. What a great resource. Now, Nicole, we talked uh, before the podcast started. You asked me if the fourth edition would be available on the subscription. And what I said was not right away. It will be available at some point in time first in a collection that will feature Elizabeth Mills books, and then later we'll add it to the full subscription. But for now, the third edition is available. It's got great material. This is a, a 2017 edition. You know, that's there as well as both of her professional genealogy titles and some other titles. We have roughly 144 of our how-to books and guidebooks. This is a collection that's only available from us Almost all of those books are under copyright, so you either either purchase the books or get a hold of uh, of the subscription, so that you have those books available whenever you are uh, doing doing your research. When we talked earlier, you mentioned a uh, a county in Tennessee, and I said, oh, while you're working, you can always go to the map guide and find out the history of the county. That's just one example of how the how-to books and guidebooks will support you when you're working with uh, roughly 650 other books, which are books focused on colonial America up to about the Civil War. If you are looking for uh, a revolutionary ancestor, you know, that collection is some of the best books you will find anywhere. That'll give, give people an idea of, of what's there and what's available in the subscription. And you can always go to our website, genealogical.com. You can click on the subscriptions tab, and it will tell you a little bit about how the subscriptions work. And you can also click on the ebooks tab, and you can see, oh, do you have any books of interest to me? Because the ebooks tab will let you search almost all of the titles, at least find almost all the titles that are in the subscription. There are only a couple of titles that are not listed on the website because we're not making them available yet as individual volumes. But you can search titles. You can search by author, by title. You can search by region. You can search by time period or by subject. And those filters work together. So you can say, oh, do you have books on Massachusetts in the colonial time period or the revolutionary period and get a pretty good idea before you purchase a subscription. And then the other side is when you have the subscription, you can find books that you want to have as print books. That's the that's the other part. So, you know, have fun searching, find some books that you want. And, and instead of buying this book or that book and kind of like buying a pig in the poke, you'll already know that that book is exactly what you want. So we priced it in such a way that we want lots of people to use the subscription, whether it's for three months and then come back later, or whether it's year by year, it's going to just up to, up to you, the purchaser. That's so great. One feature that really stood out to me was the read aloud option. And as somebody who loves listening to audiobooks, and I do feel pressed for time sometimes, it is a really nice option to be able to read a book through having someone read it to me. So thank you for adding that feature. And I think that will be really nice to be able to read some of these how-to books without having to sit down and look at the page myself while I'm doing dishes or whatever I'm working on. I can still gain the value from it. Exactly. One of our affiliates, when I first sent him a, a, a sample you know, code to, to log into the subscription, comes back. And that was exactly what he was most interested in. He said, this is great. He says, I'm visually impaired. I can enlarge the type, but I also can have uh, a, a book read to me. And, and you can read it using the app from any platform. So you can listen from your car, from a train or a plane, 
something like that. So thanks for pointing that out. Well, let's talk a little bit more about some of the books that are available in my GPC library that are more focused on searching records for ancestors. So of course, we know that with the internet, Ancestry and Family Search have these big collections full of millions of records. So can you tell us a little bit about what these books in my GPC library offer that we cannot get from the big data websites? The one thing that I've already pointed out that are that's not available in the big sites is the guidebooks, the guidebooks and how-to books. Uh, more than 96 or 97 percent of those are books written by our authors, written by the authorities, uh, and that's something that you can only find uh, from GPC. The other part really has to do with the difference between using a book and using a search engine just to find data. Because from the book, you're getting something something more. You're getting a point of view of the, of the author um, and not just a number and a date. And you'll find things related by using the book because on the pages, you'll find other people, other places, and other events. It's the way that you use it as a book that is... Uh, different from what you get online and part of the reason why the book has been so successful over centuries and centuries. I love that. Some of the material, even some of our books are available on the various websites because they're books that are in public domain. But a lot of the books, probably mm, about 60% or so of the books on the site are ones that you won't find anywhere else. And, there, and there's some great books, some great books on Virginia, some great books on New England and the like. And then when it comes to uh, Irish or Scottish material or the Royal and Noble material, you just aren't going to find those on uh, on the major sites because they're not the, not the biggest areas of interest. Well, one thing that stood out to me that you just said is that when you access material like this through a book, you do it differently than you do when you're searching a website. Mm -hmm. And I've found that to be very true. And especially the part about finding other events and other people that were possibly in the community of our ancestor and learning about them at the same time. And that can be so valuable, especially for our challenging research questions that require us to do fan club research. And I'll talk a little later in the episode about one of the books I searched and how I recognized a lot of names from the community of my ancestor. But I think that's really important. Yeah, I agree. It, with a book, you can see the context of the record so much better. And when I am looking at something online, say on Ancestry or Family Search, I always want to go figure out more. And sometimes you just can look at the book that's digitized if it is digitized, and sometimes you can't. So having the full book is just amazing. So Barry, I'd love to have you tell us a little bit more about how the new ebook library works. We've talked a little bit about the tools such as being able to listen to audio, and then you also mentioned notes, but maybe just give us a rundown of some of the special tools there and how someone that is just brand new would go about making the best use of it. Well, my favorite way of, uh, of pointing to the advantages of what the bookshelf platform and the my gpc library can do uh, has to do with the searching particularly surname searching so you can put in a a surname now you were looking for schultz one of your family names and i kind of took a couple a couple of minutes last week and went oh look at this there's so many different spellings you know you've got the c the ch the s the z how do I find them? Well, you'd have trouble if you were if you're just doing a, a random search, but you can search by different variations of the spelling. And you don't have to be specific. You can put in a few letters and it will pull up and show you all of the books in which those letters appear in that order. Now, sometimes it's kind of amusing. Like I put in DNA in, in the search and I see a, a Spanish handwriting book and I'm going, What's that got to do with DNA? Well, that was part of a name. It was something Dana, blah, blah, blah. And I went, oh, that's amusing, but I eliminated that one right away. So so if it's something that doesn't fit, whether it's a DNA or a Schultz, 
you can eliminate that very quickly and narrow down the, the books that will apply. And you can do it so easily. Once the list of titles appears of uh, books that, that have a hit on that name, you can click on them one at a time and over in a side panel, it will show you the instances of that word or words in the book. And you can quickly look and say, no, it doesn't apply, or maybe it does. And then click and go right back, continue on your list, click, 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 book by book by book. And sometimes you'll have many, many books to look at. And then you can begin to add you know, limiters. You could add a geographical limiter. You could say, and uh, Stansbury, and it will only show you books in which both the word Maryland and Stansbury appear, or you can use the surname and a given name, or a couple of given names to say, oh, I know that there's an Elizabeth Stansbury that's related to a Jemima Stansbury, so if I put in Stansbury, Elizabeth, Jemima, I'll only see books where both are mentioned, and I'll have a much better chance of finding people who are of the same family. So uh, the search and the search is a lot of fun. It will bring up books that are that you don't expect to see. One of the people who works with us was looking for her Virginia ancestors, and she kept seeing Tennessee books. So she clicked on the Tennessee book to see what it was, and you know what she found? She discovered the children moved. <laughs> I found that a little amusing. Anyway, <laughs> I don't like that. So oh, yeah, people from Virginia never moved. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we laugh because all of our ancestors in Virginia moved west or south. That's so, awesome. Yeah, sooner or later. So the search tools are, are what I find to be really exciting and a great addition, because um, uh, partly for the surprises and partly because when you're searching, when you put in a search term, that term you're searching all of the books in my GPC library at one time. So it takes a little time for the search engine, but a lot less than it would for you to go book by book. And it will look for Schultz in all 800 titles, there are roughly 857 volumes or so currently in that library. And that search engine is going through every one of those books. That's so fun because I just did that search again and one of the first ones that I know exactly what the record is because it's my latest research project is this names of foreigners who took the oath of allegiance. And this is one where my immigrant ancestor that we talked about at the beginning, Valentine Schultz is in that or a Valentine Schultz, not really sure for, you know, exactly which one it is, but that's so fun. And I see other titles such as Pennsylvania German pioneers, but here's a fun one. More Psychic Roots, Further Adventures in Serendipity and Intuition in Genealogy. So, I mean, there's some things here that look kind of fascinating for me to explore. <laughs> I have to laugh because I actually own two copies of Psychic Roots. I'm fascinated by those stories of people having serendipity in their genealogy research. Yes, well, what you've discovered is Hank Jones did more than shrink the kids. <laughs> That for those for those of you who are listening, Hank Jones is the author of the Psychic <laughs> Roots books. It's such a fun collection of stories. All righty. Well, I just have been playing around with the site as we've been talking and the search feature. It really is nice. I like how the results appear at the top in a slider with, you know, Maryland marriages, 14 results. Settlers of Mar Maryland, one result. Runaway convicts six results. And when you click on that little box, it opens up the sidebar and shows you the context of the surname you searched for. So I searched for Hollingsworth on my dad's side. And in the Runaway Servants, Convicts, and Apprentices book, I can see that there's a Charles Hollingsworth and it's in New Jersey and the year is 1776. So it gives you a little context to know, do you really want to click on that one? Is that going to be relevant to your family, it gives you some of the helpful information to quickly make that determination. So it's a really great site. Yeah, you get you get the benefit of both the digital side and the and the book side. You get to search and, and discover the books. And then you get to open the book and work with the book, page through it if you like, look at the table of contents, uh, use the read aloud for the introduction because with a lot of the books, even some of the books that were public domain books, uh, we've added introductory material to 
you know, to kind of guide you through the use of the book. So we see it as a, a great combination. Yes, it's definitely a resource that you can use to advance your your research, especially colonial ancestry. There are so many books from that early time period where things get a little more challenging and you really do need all the help you can get. I like when you click on one of the books from your search results that on the left side, you have a panel with all of the chapters and, and you can click on the chapters there. And then in the middle, you have the page that you're reading. And then on the right, it still keeps your search results in case you want to go to one of the other search results from the book. Then at the bottom, you have the slider for where you are within the book progress and the page number and the total number of pages and a little arrow to page through the book. So it really is a very fancy tool. I'm not sure which screen you're looking at, but usually in the upper left, you'll see three little dots. If you click on those, it gives you the option to choose a citation and save the citation for the book that you're looking at. It also gives you the option to save the page within the subscription platform for that book. So you can save the URL of that specific page, put that in your notes, so when you ever come back to the book, you don't have to go, well, now, where was I? Do I need to search again for uh, Valentine Schultz? Uh, uh, you go, ah, oh, here's the citation of, of the page that I found that has the information that I want. Yes. Okay. Thanks for pointing that out. So yeah, I do see the three dot options for the book uh, in that left panel next to the title of the book for making a citation, copying the page URL, and then reading offline. Those are three great options. I didn't notice that. Thank you, Barry. You're welcome. Well, let's take a minute and have a word from our sponsors, newspapers.com. Dive into the newspapers where your family's history unfolds as you search nearly a billion pages in seconds. Newspapers.com offers an unparalleled treasure trove of historical newspapers, providing a window into the past. With papers from the 17th century to today, Newspapers.com is the largest online newspaper archive. It's a goldmine for anyone seeking to uncover stories from the past. Whether you're a seasoned genealogist or just starting your journey, Newspapers.com makes it easy to search for obituaries, birth announcements, and the everyday stories that shaped your family. It's like having a time machine at your fingertips. And here's the best part. Our listeners get an exclusive offer. Use promo code FAMILYLOCKET for a 20% discount on your subscription. That's FAMILYLOCKET at Newspapers.com. Sign up today at Newspapers.com and embark on a journey of discovery. Well, let's talk about some specific books because there are so many and, you know, with 800, we obviously can't talk about all of those, but we, we each picked out some of our favorites. And one that I was drawn to right away was Roberta Estes's book, DNA for Native American Genealogy. And I own the paper copy of that book and have read it thoroughly, but I love that you have it here in the library for anyone that just wants to check it out and you know, you have this story that you've got the Cherokee princess in your ancestry and you want to see if that's true. Does DNA show that? And Roberta gives such a great overview of how to use mitochondrial DNA and Y DNA and what to expect in your ethnicity estimates. So it was really fun to see that book. And I just love the way you see the book. Like when you were mentioning, you want it to look like the paper copy and it does. I love that it has all the color and the headings and the images. And, you know, if you have a struggle with your eyes and you really need things to be larger, make it easier to read. This is just amazing. So, so fun. That's one that I was really excited to see as part of the library. Yay. I love that book. And I'm excited to review it again in my GPC because then you can highlight things and save your highlights and you can come back to it. It'll be really nice. I agree. And then I found another one that was titled The Colonial Families of the Southern States of America. And I've been, you know, kind of fascinated with the colonial part of my ancestry. And I noticed that when I went into this book, I saw there was a whole chapter on the Wyatts of Virginia, hmm. which is very interesting to us, Nicole, because we have our ancestor, Richard Wyatt Royston, mm -hmm. and we really do not know who his mother is. This was from Gloucester County, 
and it's severely burned. We don't have all the good things that we normally would have for researching in the 1700s. We don't have the marriages or probate, anything to connect families, but we have those names. And so just looking through the Wyatts of Virginia, I love looking at all the different families and thinking about perhaps one of these women could have been uh, the mother of our Richard Wyatt Royston. So wow. it's fun and it's just full of names and dates and places. So these are really wonderful sources to start with on your colonial research. You know, you don't need to rewrite anything. Just go to what's already published and then use that to go forward. So I think that's a real value of this library, being able to access these types of books. In the library, according to my notes, 453 of the books are focused on the colonial period. And when you mention Virginia, there are 53 titles that are Virginia books specifically. Revolutionary period, 354. So, you know, if you're looking for a revolutionary ancestor, you got a pretty good chance of finding that person somewhere in the My GPC library collection. Yeah, I absolutely agree. One thing that I thought of about this is that when you're starting a research project for a colonial ancestor, it's so wise to review the published information on that person or that family or that time period, because so often there are many derivatives created from the original records and and many authored works that can help guide us. So it's really important to do a literature survey to really know what's been printed, what's been published already on the topic before we go start looking in the original records again, because we need to see, you know, what people have already done, what they, how they've interpreted it. And we can either build on that work or we can, you know, sometimes we don't agree with that. And so we can kind of look at things in a new way. Now, I love what you, uh, what you just added, because so many of these books were written by contemporaries of the person that you're looking for. So you get a very different point of view when the material and the stories are written by uh, contemporaries of, of the people. So true. Well, Mary, did you want to highlight a specific book? If not, we can go on to mine because I have about 10 I want to highlight. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you go on to, to your list and I will comment. Uh, as I say, like you'd mentioned, Roberta, R- Roberta Essie's we have a new book coming out shortly on DNA from Roberta. That's as much as I'll give away at this at this point. Ooh, right, tantalizing. Um, but it is possible <laughs> if if I get the file early enough that the ebook may be available for Roots Tech. Well, that would be wonderful. I love Roberta. Her book on Native American DNA is so wonderful, and. I read everything that she writes, so I can't wait to find out what the topic is. (laughs) All right. Well, some of the books that I picked out to talk about were, first of all, Professional Genealogy by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. And we mentioned this briefly, but this is such an important work for anyone following our podcast who wants to research like a pro. This is the manual for anyone wanting to become a professional genealogist. And there are two editions. The first from 2001 was subtitled a manual for researchers, writers, editors, lecturers, and librarians. And that first edition is the one that I studied in ProGen. Now come to think of it, I think I did focus on the 2017, the second edition, but we had to go back to the 2001 edition for the chapter on transcriptions and abstracts. So both of them are just wonderful because they're not the same. They Each chapter is written by a new person in the second edition, and there's new chapters in the second edition. So you really need both, and both are available in the MyGPC library. And so this is a wonderful place to be able to access the Professional Genealogy Manuals by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. And the subtitle of the second edition from 2017 is Preparation, Practice, and Standards. So I think you'll find that both of these are just invaluable. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, they are big books. And so if you are limited in space on your bookshelf, as some of us are, as we continue to add books to our physical collection, it might be nice to be able to access those through the the MyGPC library and save yourself some space. 
and also just be able to really quickly search for things using the search engine there. So I heartily agree. Those are both books that as professionals or aspiring professionals, we need to have access to. Another one that I had on my list that many of you will recognize is Ancestral Trails, The Complete Guide to British Genealogy and Family History by Mark D. Herber. And from what I have learned, this is the book for British genealogy. Is that right? (laughs) Yes. And I have that physical copy too on my shelf. (laughs) (laughs) So do I. So that one shows up in the MyGPC library and you can learn um, everything you want to know about researching in the British Isles. And, and there's a lot of things that are different about researching there. So it's important to study and understand that. And this book is actually a winner of the Library Association's Outstanding Reference Work. So it received that medal. I really love how these books show up and you know, we get to see the table of contents page, but then when we click on a chapter, it takes us directly to that chapter in on the website. And I find that so helpful that we don't have to scroll through and try to find it. We can get directly to it. And I also love the feature to search within. So just thinking about ancestral trails and this whole idea of British genealogy, it is a big detailed book. So let's say you specifically just want to learn about probate, say, you know, you can put that in your search bar and then you can get all the instances within the book. So I love that. I mean, there's just so many great features to being able to read a book like this on this type of a platform. I am uh, thrilled to just listen to what you're saying Uh, because it's exactly what I wanted to produce when I put the books together into a library offering. And I said, "Uh, this is what we need. We need an easy way to to search the books, to find the books, to search within the books, and then to have the book there for all that it offers. So thank you for, (laughs) for the compliments. Well, we have to thank you because you shared it with us. So speaking of ancestral trails and you looked up probate, mom, I looked up illegitimacy because that's one of the things I've studied in our career line. William Creer married Sarah Jane Miller, who was born as an illegitimate child in Lincolnshire, England in 1841. And she's one of the ancestors I've studied a lot. And there are several parts of ancestral trails that have discussions about illegitimacy. And and there's a a section about it in the parish registers. There's some bibliography entries. So there's a lot to be found that you cannot really find as easily when you have the physical book, because even though you look in the index, the index doesn't always include every single instance of the word, whereas the search function does. So this is just pretty cool. I agree. And the search function puts it in context of the paragraph or the sentence. So you can get a little bit of a hint about what it's about, you know, so I love that too. So yeah, this is, <laughs> this is fun. We're having fun, obviously listeners, as we are going through this and discovering things about searching books. Well, I better get on with my favorite books because I have three more. <laughs> <laughs> I think you had some fun. Okay. Well, here's my next one. Tennessee Cousins, A History of Tennessee People by Worth S. Ray. There are sections in this book for each county. And of course, I went to my brick wall county, Hawkins County, Tennessee, where I've been searching for the parents of John Robert Dyer, who was born in 1810, probably in Hawkins County, Tennessee. Records conflict about where he was born, but some say that he was born there in that county, and that's where he lived his whole life, at least the records I have from 1830 forward. Well, I haven't found too many candidates for his father that lived in Hawkins County just because of record loss. Um, I have found that there was a store that had records at the Tennessee archives and there was an Ignatius Dyer. Haven't really been able to identify him, but then in the book, Tennessee Cousins in my GPC library, I read through the whole Hawkins County section and found two more candidates for a parent of John Robert Dyer. Wow. And the thing that really stood out to me is that the author had um, some background information on the first newspaper that was published there in Hawkins County. And the county seat is Rogersville. 
in Hawkins County. And in Rogersville, there was a newspaper published called the Knoxville Gazette starting in the early 1790s. And that's kind of funny. And the author talks about the fact that it is weird that they had a a newspaper called the Knoxville Gazette published in Rogersville. Eventually it was moved to Knoxville, um, but it started in Rogersville. And in one of those early issues of the Knoxville Gazette, on June 30th, 1792, there was an article about the taxpayers in Rogersville. And it says, at the meeting of a committee appointed by the Worshipful Court of Hawkins County at the June term to examine the stray master's books, we do find that the following persons are indebted to the county for the following sums. And then one of the people listed was a Francis Dyer. So that person, whether it be a male or a female, is a candidate for either a parent or grandparent of John Robert Dyer, maybe unrelated. Dyer's a common name, but it's something, it's a lead to follow. The other thing I found was a list of military officers in Hawkins County in 1794. And this was a man named Henry Dyer listed as an ensign. So that was exciting to find another Dyer possible, possible research subject of a future project. Wow. That's so exciting and so fabulous. And you wouldn't have easily found them without this book. Well, I haven't found them yet. And I've been working on this research problem for years. <laughs> the other thing I found is that as I read through the whole section on Hawkins County in the Tennessee Cousins book, is that I recognized many of the names I've identified as fan club, associates, people who might be related to John Robert Dyer in some way, associated with him. Some of the surnames are Mitchell and Armstrong. John Robert Dyer named one of his sons Richard Fane Dyer. And I've always wondered where does that middle name come from? Fane, F A I N. And that's always been a clue to me. Well, in the chapter on Hawkins County and Tennessee Cousins, it mentions early burials at the Rogersville Cemetery and including one called Ruth Fane Powell. And that's just interesting to me that this Fane surname is used among some of the earlier settlers of Hawkins County. And just a clue that I need to keep digging on that Fane surname and the origins within the county and see where it comes from. Wow, that is amazing. Another one I liked was the 2400 Tennessee Pensioners by Zella Armstrong, Revolution and War of 1812. So if you have questions about your military ancestors, you can search that. I searched for Dyer and I found my friend Baldy Dyer, who I've talked about on the podcast before. And it has the same information that I found in his pension information for the War of 1812, but it lists his dates of service in 1814 and his heirs, Willie James, William, David, Susanna Simpson, and Mary Dyer. So that was fun. And my last two books are about South Carolina. This one is the original index book showing the revolutionary claims filed in South Carolina by Janie Revel. And I wanted to learn more about the background of this book because when I looked inside, it was just it was basically an index. And when I went to the South Carolina archives, which was mentioned in the index books forward, it talks about how the archives have some of these documents. Well, at the South Carolina archives website, they had a PDF document about their revolutionary war collections. And it talks about this index and it says the general index and state of the returns and entry books for South Carolina revolutionary war claims lists only the names of the claimants and the number of the list called a return with which the auditor and accountant general forwarded the audited account to a legislative committee. The back of the volume also contains a list of officers and men on the frigid South Carolina. The numbered returns do not survive. A published transcription of the volume by Janie Revel is shelved with the original record. So this is a transcription of the original index. And so I looked in this for Welch because I have done a lot of research on George Welch trying to find his parents. And one of the candidates for the parent is William Welch. And William is listed in the index. I had seen that he was possibly a Revolutionary War soldier. Not too much is known about him and... He's still a candidate for George's father, but George isn't listed as one of his heirs anywhere. Some people think Nicholas Welch was the father of George Welch, but this is giving me a clue that there are possibly some more records at the South Carolina archives about his Revolutionary War service, because in that same finding aid I was reading, it mentions that there are two other series of records from the records of South Carolina auditor and accountant general 
at the archives, the schedule of accounts passed from 1778 to 1780, and accounts in receipt for balance of cash in 1780. So who knows what's there, but um, even though all of the originals don't remain, now I have a clue that I can go follow up on at the archives. Well, and that's the real value of these types of records, these derivative types, because you need something to give you a clue. You know, otherwise it's a needle in a haystack, but now you know that you can perhaps even contact the archives and have them pull that record for you. Or we could just go in person. I was there last summer and I wish I would have known to look for that. <laughs> <laughs> There's always so much to do. At right. The archive. Well, that's such a good point that if we ever are going to an archive, we should do a literature survey and see, you know, what these authors have done. They've done such a great service to go and create these index books and these transcriptions of the originals to help us as finding aids. Well, my last book that I picked out was by Brent Holcomb. We talked about him in a previous podcast because he made a, a lot of books about South Carolina research that have been helpful to me. And this one I wanted to look at is called South Carolina Naturalizations from 1783 to 1850. And in our previous podcast series on naturalization records, we talked about you know having to go to the court and submit your first papers and things. And we talked more about naturalization in the later years. And this is in the earlier years. So I was very curious when I saw this title. And so I went to the chapter on Pendleton District, which became Anderson District in 1826, and just read through all of the 30 or so naturalizations that have been extracted from the court records. And you know, what's funny is that where do you think most of them were from? 23 were from Ireland. And then there were five from England. And they actually were listed as Great Britain. So ah. that was so fun to think about. You know, we've hypothesized in the past that our Welch and Keaton and Harris ancestors, you know, were Scotch Irish and came from possibly Ireland or Scotland and and thinking about that how they landed in North Carolina and South Carolina. And it was fun to see that that really was where a lot of Irish people went in the early 1800s. Yeah, those patterns of immigration are important for us in trying to put our people in place because as we've learned and talked about, there just were not a lot of great records. Everybody was already in the British Empire who was coming over and so they didn't really care that much about them. So I find that very interesting that the ones from Ireland, this group of 23 people, had to seek naturalization. So apparently they weren't considered from the same country as England. Because well, this was after the United States had separated from Great Britain. So it was 1783 uh -huh. to 1850. So that's why you're seeing the naturalizations there. Interesting. Well, I'm sure I could go on and on about different books in my GPC library, but I'll stop there because <laughs> we are getting to the end of our time allotted for recording this. But we just have to say thank you, Barry, for coming on our podcast and sharing this wonderful subscription with us. Well, Nicole and Diana, thank you for having me. I love listening to your story because it illustrates the variety of titles and that there's, there's something there for almost everyone. So it's been a delight. Thank you for having me. And now I will look forward to, uh, <laughs> to probably listening to the podcast when it's actually released. Yes, it will be fun. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. Have a great week, everyone, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your research. If you want to learn more, purchase our books, Research Like a Pro and Research Like a Pro with DNA on Amazon.com and other booksellers. You can also register for our online courses or study groups of the same names. Learn more at familylocket.com slash services. To share your progress and ask questions, join our private Facebook group by sending us your book receipt or joining our courses. To get updates in your email inbox each Monday, subscribe to our newsletter at familylocket.com slash newsletter. Please subscribe, rate, and review our podcast. We read each review and are so thankful for them. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.